Hello and welcome to our webinar on flow and contaminant transport in the unsaturated zone using FIFO. My name is Nilson Giger. I am with Water Services and Technologies, a company specialized in groundwater modeling and hydrogeological services. And this webinar is made possible with the support of DHI, the developers of FIFLO. So first, we are going to talk about the unsaturated zone principles. Unsaturated zone is where the pores are totally filled with water and unsaturated zone, the pores are partially filled with water, partially filled with air. In the saturated zone, it can be divided into two parts. The air part where the pressure is positive, that means that if I put a well here, the water will go in the well below this point. And the part of the saturated zone where, although it's totally saturated, there is a negative pressure, there is a suction pressure that if I put a well here, the water doesn't go in. This uh, suction pressure is caused by the capillary forces and it's called capillary fringe. And once you are below the capillary fringe, then you have the air entry a point where there is partially filled with water and air and the suction in order to take the water out of the soil needs more and more suction if the profile is in equilibrium. Of course, if it rains on the surface, that equilibrium is not there anymore. But what we can see here on this side is this idea that if you are below the water table, you cannot put more water. The maximum saturation you can get in a soil is equal to the total porosity. As you go in the capillary fringe, the suction pressure is starts to be negative. You have to apply some suction to take water out of it. And this is the same phenomenon that is caused by when you put some toilet paper in a glass of water and you see it going up. And it's going up because of the capillary forces and the capillary force is dependent on two things. One is the size of the capillary tube uh, and the other one is the type of material which would bring the friction or the rugosity of the material that can bring more or less up. So if you have a, a small pipe, even if it's glass, then you have uh, the capillary force capable of bringing the water up, making it more difficult to take the water out of the soil. So plants, for example, have to apply more negative pressure to take the water out. If you have a larger tube, then the capillary suction pressure, the capillary force is not as intense and therefore it's easier to take the water out. And that happens in the clay soil. What happens is that the pores are quite small and by being quite small, the capillary forces in the clay is higher and therefore the capillary fringe in clay can go up to two or four meters high. While the capillary fringe in sand, for example, loose sand, it may be just a few centimeters because it has a large pore. As you start to get the soil start to get drier, so the saturation starts to get smaller, it becomes more and more difficult to get water out of the soil. In fact, there is one point where it's basically impossible to take the water out of the soil, even if you apply a huge pressure. And that point is called the, the residual saturation, SR sometimes, or theta R. And in between the residual saturation and the total saturation, every plant, every different type of plant has a wilting point where it's too much negative pressure for that particular plant to take our water out of the soil and therefore uh, the plant does not survive. So the soil scientists keep uh, trying to get saturation above the wilting point, but not as high so that there is no waste of water for irrigation, for example. 
Now, reminding of the Darcy's law, Darcy's law says that the, the flow rate divided by a certain area, as we like to work not by flow rate, because uh, uh, then every aquifer, it would be this different calculations. So we calculate in flux, which is flow rate by unit area, is proportional, directly proportional to the hydraulic gradient. And the constant of proportionality is the hydraulic conductivity. As we know it, hydraulic conductivity totally saturated. Now, let's remember that hydraulic head, it uh, is comprised of two portions, the pressure and elevation. So if you are in a certain point, you have so many meters of column of water above that point. And by adding up the elevation, which is the potential of gravity, plus the potential of pressure, that's the total hydraulic head. Therefore, you can calculate two points, even if they are at the different elevations, by adding up the pressure on top of it, you can compare point A or point B, which one has the smallest head, therefore the water moves from point A to point B. So let's keep that concept that will be important in the unsaturated equations. When we talk about the equation, groundwater flow equation, we start with a mass balance over control volume. So let's imagine that you have a very small control volume and you have the flow rate coming in and the flow rate coming out, which could be plus or minus a difference here in every direction. If you have a mass balance, you do the sum of the difference in all direction of total flow coming in minus total flow coming out. If it comes more in than out, there is the change is stored in the volume. If you have more coming out than coming in, you are taking water from storage. Now, when you talk about total flow rate coming in or out, it's not only by the neighbor control volumes or the neighbor cells or elements, if we're talking numerical models, but also there is the component of sources or sinks. That can be wells, can be river uh, or recharge. So it can be plus, if it's adding water to the system, or it can be negative if it's taking water from the system, for example. So we say plus or minus sources or sinks. Now, if we do Qx minus Qx plus partial Qx ux, partial x, that what remains is partial Qx over partial x. And that brings us to the transient groundwater flow equation by replacing the Qx dx by Darcy's law, which is k partial h over partial x. Therefore, this one says plus or minus sinks or sources of water, external water, plus the difference of whatever comes in and out in the x direction, plus the difference in and out of y direction, and z is equal to the difference of storage in time. Now, in storage, when we talk about saturated or confined aquifers, all the pores were totally filled with water. And you are trying to take water from those pores, even though it was originally filled with water, and it will continue to be filled with water. How can you do that? You can do that with by taking into account the compaction of the soil plus the expansion of water. And in fact, we call it uh, the specific storage is equal alpha plus N, which is the porosity, beta rho G. So that is for confined aquifer, this S, or for confined cells, areas where the cells totally under the water and the water table is above it all the time. The only way to take water out of that cell from storage is compaction of the soil and expansion of water. Now, if you are in a situation where the water table was here and now it's here, you actually 
dewater those pores. Then we call it specific yield. You took water from the porosity. However, there is some water that is around the grains based by kept by capillary forces, and therefore you cannot take all the water out. So you have some specific retention. But basically, if you have a confined aquifer, you have specific storage. If you have unconfined specific yield. In the unconfined aquifer, you also have specific storage acting all the time, but specific yield is so much higher in the order of poros 10 to minus 1. Then specific storage is 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5. We use either one or another in this situation. Now, if we're talking unsaturated zone, we have exactly the same equation. The difference is that now the pores are partially filled with air already. So the only water that you can take out from storage is by decreasing the saturation. So therefore you have d theta dt. Remembering that head is equal pressure plus elevation, the two components, let's replace that. And also in this case, there is another situation. Now we are talking here in the saturated zone, a fixed K. So the K value is dependent on the material only. Now, in the unsaturated zone, as the soil gets drier, it's more difficult for the water to flow. Therefore, K value is now dependent on the saturation. However, saturation is dependent on pressure. We saw that as you apply more negative pressure, then saturation is a function of pressure. Therefore, K value varies with pressure. That makes the equation non-linear because now by replacing that, we say K value is a function of pressure and replacing H by P over whole G plus Z. When we take the first derivative in X of DZ is equal to zero, doesn't show. In Y is equal to zero, doesn't show. DZ, DZ is equal to one, it shows here. But basically, then what remains is the pressure. And we have a variable which is dependent on an unknown. Therefore, the equation is nonlinear. And this term here of d theta dt, we can break it apart as d theta, how saturation varies with pressure and pressure with time. This is called the Richards equation in three dimensions. And this equation, therefore, we need two functions. How hydraulic conductivity varies with pressure and how saturation varies with pressure. These are called constitutive relationships where we can say the parametric functions, for example, soil water retention, theta as the point of pressure. So in this case, we have the negative pressure we have the saturated residual here, and we have for different type of material, we have this type of equations. The other parametric function is how hydraulic conductivity varies with saturation. We start with saturated soil and it has the Ks, which is constant with time. So after this point, so after saturation is already at saturation, which is porosity, K does not vary anymore. But as saturation decreases, it becomes more difficult for the water to flow through. Why? It's illustrated here. We have all the area to flow the water here, except in between the pores. And now we have another obstacle. So the water has to flow around these bubbles of air here. So therefore, the hydraulic conductivity decreases. It's more difficult for the water to flow through. The same happens in clay. An interesting phenomenon is that in clay, these air bubbles, they don't coagulate as much and they are smaller. And therefore, the relative obstacles that have to go through is more diffuse. So it actually happens a phenomenon where, although the K saturation of the sand 
is much higher than clay, it may happen the opposite in the unsaturated zone. At one point, relatively speaking, the hydraulic conductivity in the clay will not decrease as much, relatively speaking, than the in the sand. Therefore, you may even have an inversion here of the factors. Now, the challenges of the Richards equation is therefore the fact that the equation is nonlinear and can be highly nonlinear because when you see a relation like that, one can see that a small variation in pressure head can cause a big variation in the saturation. So it's highly nonlinear. Find these parametric expressions. It's not an easy task. One can measure in the lab for every different type of soil. You could go there and say, for example, make it totally saturated, measure the flow rate, therefore measure the, the hydraulic conductivity, and then you apply some suction, becomes unsaturated, measure the hydraulic conductivity, apply some suction, measure again, and therefore you could come up with a, a relationship of K and saturation or saturation negative pressure on your own and do that for every type of soil. But it's a major effort and we know that the soil can be very heterogeneous and we don't have the resource to do that. Another challenge is that these curves can present some hysteresis. So if the, the soil is drying, you may have one relationship and if it's wetting, another deviation, a little deviation due to hysteresis. Now, luckily, what happens is because this is common in agriculture, for example, there were several researchers that did lots of experiments with different types of soils and trying to find equations that would represent these functions without you needing to go to the lab yourself. VFLOW supports some of these well-known researchers. So Van Genuchten, Brooks Corey, Modified Van Genuchten, Haverkamp, Exponential linear. Let's look at each one of them. Brooks Corey, we have the equation Brooks Corey. This is given by this formula. The graph has this type of shape. It requires two fitting parameters, alpha and n. Note that it needs the residual saturation and it needs the maximum saturation possible. This is used for mainly where you have sharp wet in front. It was developed in the 30s in the oil industry, and it works well for that. For unsaturated zone, water, air does not work so much. One can see here that it has a, it finished, just finished like that, doesn't have a nice curve, saturation versus head, for example, or pressure. Another researcher from Holland, Haverkamp, he developed this type of equation, just a different way of writing equation to have this type of shape. It behaves better than Brooks Corey. It also requires two feeding parameters, alpha and beta. It does require that you put maximum saturation and maximum residual. And then it therefore does saturation versus pressure. And it's, uh, it has a nice fit as well. And then we come to Van Genuchten or N modified Van Genuchten, which again, saturation, it writes here that instead of S, but saturation as a function of pressure, you need maximum saturation, residual saturation, has two fitting parameters, alpha and N, and has saturation versus pressure and K versus saturation with these two fitting parameters, alpha and N. And the nice thing about Van Genuchten is that uh, in the US salinity lab, he was able to do hundreds or thousands of experiments with different types of soils and has developed fitting parameters for many different types. So it became well known and uh, it's very much used. It's kind of a standard now. So here is one example. You have smooth curves and it's, it fits very well. It's very stable. Now how he did the experiment is again, he went measure different points of saturation and how much pressure you would have to take for to get to those saturations and made a fitting routine to find the best alpha and n. Again, also uh, in free flow, it allows you, if you have experiments yourself, 
you don't need to enter an empirical function. You can enter your points, alpha and saturation, and then it will fit the line to derive this equation. Now, you can find in Google many examples of what typical parameters we should use for different types of soils. So, sand, you would use 0.035, loam, 0.025, for example, for alpha. Now, alpha has a physical meaning. Alpha is the inverse of the height of the capillary fringe. So if we see here in long 0.025, it means that 1 over 0.025 is 40. It means that long, this long would have a capillary fringe of approximately 40 centimeters. Now, n is a fitting parameter, it doesn't have a physical meaning to it. But you could find several of these examples in the literature. Now, one thing that we're going to demonstrate in the in the exercise we're going to do with fee flow is that fee flow allows you to put upstream weighting when solving the equation. And that adds a lot of stability for the equation. And what is upstream weighting? Instead of using between two elements an average hydraulic conductivity of the elements, it uses the hydraulic conductivity of the one where the wet flow is coming from. And that adds a lot of stability as well. So it's recommended. Now, for contaminant transport, the differential equation is exactly the same for the saturated and unsaturated zone. So one would enter the same dispersion, reaction, source and sink parameters that uh, one would use in the saturated zone. So now we're going to do a live demonstration with fee flow where we're going to basically throw some contaminant, generically we're calling it ethanol. We're throwing some ethanol in the surface and we're seeing the evolution of the plume through the unsaturated zone and then it evolved into the saturated zone following the flow. So the conceptual model, we did uh, an experiment where there's a 2,000 meter long domain, 1,000 meter wide, and uh, approximate thickness of 30 meters here in the aquifer. We use the triangular prisms. In the area where the contaminant plume is going to develop, we're going to use a, a smaller spacing in the grid of about 4 meters. To respect Pecle, we're going to use a dispersivity of 1 meter, Pecle shouldn't be bigger than two, maybe getting up to four. So therefore, for a dispersivity of uh, one meter, we can go as high as four meters in terms of spacing to avoid numerical dispersion in the contaminant transport. As boundary conditions, we are going to have flow flowing from the left to the right. And here in this phase, we are going to use hydraulic head of um, five meters. And in this phase, we're going to use a hydraulic head equal to zero meters. We are going to, on the top boundary, we're going to use a constant recharge of 488 millimeters a year, which is 30% of the annual of rainfall. This is an experiment based on an air base that they did some spills of ethanol and they estimate 30% of the rainfall is the recharge rate to the soil. The simulation parameter, sorry for the Portuguese here, but it's uh, the depth of the aquifer is 30 meters, thickness of the unsaturated zone is about 6 meters, hydraulic conductivity is 8.2 meters a day, effective porosity 0.2, recharge 488 millimeters a year, ethanol concentration at the source 1000 milligrams per liter. This is alpha, that's the Fitting parameter for bang 2.7. So one can say 1.1 over 2.7. It is a very sandy soil, doesn't have much of a capillary force, capillary fringe. And 1.4, and now alpha meaning longitudinal dispersive at 1 meter, and transversal dispersive 0.1 meter. Simulation time, we're going to do five years of simulation. So here we have fee flow already open, and we are going to start a new model. 
And you start a new model it asks you if you want to do fully unstructured or 2d or layer 3d mesh we're going to use the 2d or layer 3d mesh this example you could start with um, shape files or autocad to define for example the outer polygon of your domain and where your rivers are your wells etc but we are going to start by hand here building our model. So we are talking about 0 to 2000 in X, maximum dimension in X 0 to 2000, in Y 0 to 1000. P-flow you have what's called Superman. So let's draw here just a rectangle with coordinates equal the first one be 0 0. Then the second one, we're going to put 2,000, 0. Third one, let's put 2,000, 1,000. Fourth point would be 0, 1,000. And finally, we would close with 0, 0. OK. Once we have the polygon, we are going to create a mesh in the polygon. So let's create here, view, panels, meshing. And in mesh, VFlow allows you to put advancing or triangle, triangle or, or grid builder tries to make equilateral as much as possible. And let's just accept the default and create this mesh. Here we are. And now that we have the mesh, we can make it 3D. So let's do edit 3D layer configuration. Now, Reflow works with slices and layers, which is between slices. So we have two slices and one layer at this point. Let's make this first slice equals 10 meters above sea level. And second slice, let's make it minus 20 to make approximately or to make 30 meter thickness. Now in between those, let's create layers of 5 meters each. So in between those, we have 30 meters, we would like to add another 5 slices. And therefore, we have every 5 meters in here. And let's do it so that uh, between here and here, we create another four slices so that we have spacing of one meter and also between here and here we again have spacing of one meter and therefore we have a better refinement than saturated zone because of the non-linearity it uh, requires a smaller spacing than in the saturated zone for numerical stability. And OK, we created our grid. Now we're going to create boundary conditions. We're going to put in this phase 5 meters. We're going to put in this phase 0 meters. How we do that? First, let's make it view one slice. Then we are going to create a boundary condition which is in here, boundary condition, hydraulic head, double click to make it bold. And we're going to select nodes by a longer border. So let's do from here to here. Let's copy it to all layers. Let's make it equal five meters above sea level. Okay, let's do the same on this side, from here to here. Let's copy. And let's make it zero meters above sea level. Perfect. Another boundary condition that we would like is recharge. In fee flow, recharge is called in outflow on top bottom. So let's click in here. We are in layer one. Let's select 
all elements and let me change the units here to make it millimeters a year and change that value to 488 millimeters a year. Okay, we enter all the boundary conditions that we'd like for this one. Now let's enter the hydraulic conductivity. In this case, let's make the same Kx being the same as Ky. Therefore, I'm going to use control Kx and Ky and Kz. They're all the same. Currently, they are equal one meter per day. Let's change it to 8.2 meters per day. However, I have to make sure that everything is selected in all layers. Otherwise, I just change the first layers. So now everything is selected. 8.2 meters per day. Let's give an enter. The other thing that uh, we are going to do, first let's change the type of simulation that we are doing. So let's go in here and say problem settings, edit problem settings. We would like to change to Richard's equation. And let's make a steady state flow. Okay, apply. For, for now, that's it. We are going to refine the grid so that in the area where we think the bloom is going to be, we're going to make a smaller spacing. Let's select nodes here in a square. Say, okay, my spear is going to be around here. Therefore, this part here, let's make a finer grid. Let's refine these elements. And let's refine so that approximately we have a four meter spacing. So let's refine again. Okay, so now we are about four meter spacing each. And we can run flow simulation. To run, you can just uh, click on run. In the meantime, we can create a cross section where we can see the results. So let's create this cross section. Let's call it AA. Okay, now let's see hydraulic head results. Let's go to slice nine, for example where we are below the water table and in process variables we can open up and see hydraulic head okay so that's our hydraulic head let's close the meshing component here let's make some iso lines change a little bit the color so we can see better the color to black make a little bit thicker okay let's take out edges. Those are the heads. We can view in cross-section. So our AA cross-section. Let's create some vertical exaggeration. Maybe exaggerate 10 times. In free flow, if you want to see the water table, you have to go to pressure and view zero isoline. Zero isoline is where the pressure is neither positive below the water table, neither negative in the unsaturated zone. And this is then the result. Let's remove this continuous here, leave the phreatic surface, and let's lock this view and click now on saturation. Now saturation, what we see here is Whatever is below the water table, the relative saturation is one. If I want to see the true saturation, the pore content, I can put this one. 0 0.3 is the maximum porosity. And less than 0 0.3 means that it's less saturated than porosity. Let's put relative saturation. And if we give a zoom, we can see the capillary fringe as well. So at some, at some height, 
you still have saturation and then it decreases and goes and reduces drastically because uh, it's the same soil. So saturation profile does like that, more or less. Okay, so that's our solution for the pressure in all the pores. And now let's run transport to finalize our example. So let's activate for slice. Let's go to slice or layer or slice number one. And I'm going to put the edge again to locate ourselves, make a little zoom. And in here, we are going to locate a plume all the way in the surface. So let me stop this simulation. Let's now change the type of simulation in problem settings, where not only I'm going to run flow in the Richards equation, but also mass. Now, because I'm running mass, I want to see transit. I want to see developing, the plume developing with time applied. As we apply, it shows here simulation time control. And we're going to say that we want to run this for five years, 1825. In the chemical species, let's call it ethanol. And you could change the type of decay rate. Let's leave first order decay, even though we're going to leave as zero decay rate, so it will be conservative. But that's all we would like to show here. Uh, to change here, except maybe unsaturated flow. Like I said, it's always better to use the upstream weighting when calculating this. I didn't do that last time. I'm going to apply upstream weighting here. Transport settings, we can change here. It's not, there is no change of density. So we can leave it like that. And we can then go ahead and enter the boundary conditions for transport. So in this case, we want to create a known concentration at the surface. Let's say in a square yeah, like this, we have a rectangle. We have a constant concentration is equal to 1,000 at surface. OK. And the one thing we would like to enter is material properties. Well, we can change here in mass transport. First, let's change here the longitudinal dispersivity. Let's put one. Now I have to select all elements in all layers. Let's change from five to one. And transverse dispersivity, let's put 0 0.1. Okay. The other thing that we would like to change, porosity. In fact, I should change that to 0.2. That doesn't make much of a difference, but that's what we, well, to make a difference in the velocities, but in terms of the example, it's okay. And the only thing that's missing now are the, what flow model type it's called that we're going to use. Are we going to use spline? That means we give the data. We're going to use Van Genuchten, modified Van Genuchten. There is a help here showing the equation, what parameters you need to enter. Brooks Corey or Hover Cup. Let's use Van Genuchten, but for all of these models, empirical models, there is always one thing you have to enter that they have in common. You have to enter the maximum saturation. So let's put equal porosity. And what is the residual saturation? What that we're going to leave 0.0. .0 25, which is there. So 0 0.0025. Maximum we could extract with a strong suction pressure. So we enter those. Now let's enter the fitting parameters. Alpha, which let's put 2.7, one over meter 
percent, and the fitting parameter n, which we're going to use a value of 1.4. Okay, it's offset. We can therefore make it run. Now let's click here on the results to see what's happening with concentrations, mass concentrations. And we see that at layer number one, we have concentrations equal to the source. Now let's, uh, let's view in cross section what's happening. Okay. Exaggerate here to 10. And also let's click on pressure here with control so that we can also, uh, we can locate the water table. So what's happening here is concentration is going down in the unsaturated zone. As it enters the saturated zone, it starts to be taken away with the flow. It's hard to see, but the time is shown here. We are at 60 days. And we ask to run up to 1825. Free flow, it calculates automatically an adaptive stepping scheme to calculate the time step size. So you don't have much control with that. You can <clears throat> only give the maximum time step that it allows and it checks whether during consecutive iterations, if the deviation is higher than a certain point, a certain uh, allowable amount, and it decreases the time step for you, it's, it keeps adapting time step. Now it's at 102, and what we are going to see then is this plume moving. Let me put some ISO lines here. Let's change the color of the ISO line. Now let's not show the zeros because zeros is always uh, let's change here to hundred and the base is equal. Let's say hundred. Now here, I can put the ISO lines that I would like. So I'd like to see 100. because it's running now, so it's hard to change that. But one can have the idea, it's just showing more erratic values on the, on this area here, where the concentration is smaller than certain value, then it shows this numerical garbage, we call it. But if you put a reasonable minimum amount, we, one can see the plume evolving here. And we are at time 249, and we're going to accelerate. Okay, now we are at uh, 460. The plume is still developing. And we are at slice one, two. So during the unsaturated zone, the plume goes quite vertical as we saw in cross section. 
As we get in the unsaturated zone, the plume starts to develop further. So now we can go back to cross section. So with that, we are at 600 days. There is not much else to, to see further. We saw an example of plume moving to the unsaturated zone, going to the saturated. And with that, we will stop our demonstration. Having seen the exercise in fee flow, let, uh, let's go back to the presentation where uh, we're not going to do online due to time, but one nice application of unsaturated zone modeling is for tailing the MC page, for example, where you would like to minimize the pore pressures at the foot of the dam to avoid any problem of collapse. We're going to simulate this dam, which is 10 meters, top part here, there is water level of 12 meters thickness on this face. Therefore, this boundary will have a constant head of 12 meters. And there is a seepage face on this one. And we're going to simulate two structures, a drainage tile here, and one a ceiling material on the dam body here. As boundary condition, we're going to put constant head is equal 12 meters on this face. On this face, we're going to use seepage phase. That means if the water wants to get here, it can, but the water level will not go higher than the point of the discharge point. That's a seepage phase, or meaning pressure is equal zero, equal atmosphere pre pressure here. We, we are going to use some different materials to represent the drain and later on the bottom of the dam. The seepage boundary condition is where we say that pressure is equal to zero on this phase. Therefore, uh, there is never flow that can get in the system, but flow can get out of the system which uh, in fee flow it allows you to implement hydraulic head with a fluid flow constraint. So we just say this is a constant head as long as the water doesn't enter the system, it can only get out. Now the scenario with no structures, we have the water table here and what happens is the pore pressure here is let's say 38,000 kilopascal which may help to collapse the dam here, some erosion in this part. Therefore, what happens if we put a drain here, a drain a tile, tile drain, but then we have immediate effect here on the, on the, the phreatic level. Maybe here the pressure is too, pore pressure is too, too high, a lot of water going to one point of the drain. So one could consider for example, reducing further pore pressure by putting a core uh, with a smaller hydraulic conductivity. And this would be, for example, one effect without the drain, but just with the core. And therefore, we can see the pressures on this side, the pressure negative here, still more water retained here, and uh, the capillary fringe on this side, and one can play with different scenarios, which would not be possible if you are not doing a separate zone to calculate spore pressures. With this, we would like to thank you for watching. And here are our contacts in case you need to contact us, feel free. And uh, we hope to see you in our next webinars, which are available in our YouTube channel, as well as on our page www.waterservicetech.com Thank you.